Now, if you haven't done very much in MindTap, make sure you don't get behind in that and, you know, get up to speed on it and so forth. Um, I was looking out there this morning and uh, I noticed a few people were quite behind in it. Um, <laughs> now, if there's a part you cannot figure out, like if it tells you to do the, na uh, do the, oh, I forget which one it is, but it doesn't say anything about na navigation on one of the tutorials. I mean, everyone know what I'm talking about. And you have to do the nav to put the, the navigation across the top. Um, but if you have something you can't figure out, then uh, edit, copy your code, put it into a, um, a notepad file, email that to me so I can take a look at it. And then I'll, I'll tell you, I won't tell you how to do it, but I'll, I'll give you an example of how do you do a navigation with nav across the top. Now, we only have one class this week, um, so um, I'm going to quickly go through a lot of this, um, try to hit upon the, the high highlights and so forth. Um, this is over an invitation to computer science, and it talks about the building blocks, uh, binary numbers, bo Boolean logic, and gates. Um we got base 10, base 2 numbers, and um, talks about uh, constructing a circuit and so forth. This talks about the fundamental building blocks of all computer systems, um, binary representation, Boolean logic, gates, circuits. Um, chapter examines what the computing agent looks like and how it's able to execute instructions and produce results. Now, our bin binary number system is uh, based upon a base two. The idea of a binary is that it's uh, on and off, yes, no, true, false, positive, negative, uh, ones or zeros. All data stored inside a computer is stored in binary, uh, also called uh, machine language, and interpreted as play on the screen in, uh, in human language. Here's an example of a bunch of ones and zeros. And um, let me see if I can get this, get my tablet going here. I think this is a little bit a little bit trickier than some of the other topics, so that's why I'm focusing on this instead of the CSS. Although if you're, um, I think only one of you, <laughs> so the next one, then you already know this. And paint.net. Hmm. What's that piece of paper say? I can't read it. Maybe read that. Probably can't hear me or something. I can't hear them. Let's see. Manage participants. The what? Oh, well, that's fine. I wonder if I can turn that on, though. Let me see. Oh, didn't crash. Uh, it seems to collide with the recording whenever I do that. Can you hear me in, um, in Arc City? <laughs> um somebody somebody emailed me through um uh blackboard and let me know what you're seeing hearing or assuming you can hear me let's see i didn't when i said can you hear me i didn't say anybody nodding their heads yes so i'm assuming they're not hearing me Sorry. 
Well, that's just great. <laughs> I ca <laughs> Let's try paint. Uh, paint. Uh, let's see. Someone in Arc City. Uh, email me through Blackboard. So I got the, I got that on. I can't hear so if I didn't have that on. It's the walls. The walls have screwed up everything. Well, that's not related to that. There's one. We can't hear you, but we can see you now. Can't hear me. Look at you asking the most obvious. <laughs> If it's on or not. Maybe I'll quit using that thing. But I can't hear them. Could be. Um, hmm. Can't start video. Failed to start the video camera. Please select another video camera in settings. Well, this is great. Audio settings. Hey, I can hear you. Can you hear me then? Yes. Oh, okay, great. We can't see it. That's fine. Uh, I'm just happy to have uh, the audio. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not gonna touch it anymore. <laughs> okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Good. Um. 
I know I have sometimes I have trouble with uh, showing the video and recording at the same time. That's what um, I don't think that screwed up. Though. I couldn't hear him before. I think it's that camera. Um, the binary number system, a uh, bunch of ones and zeros. Basically, that's how um, I'm not sure if you could hear that what I said earlier, but all data inside a computer is stored in binary format. So you need to have a little bit of understanding on that. Um, you got your um, base 10, which is where you used to, digits 0 to 9, and then you got your base 2. Now, if I look at a, um, a number, so I got 1, 0, 1, 1, 1. So this is our representation inside of the, the computer in terms of 1s and zeros, on and off. This far right position is our 2 to the 0 position. This is 2 to the 1st. This is 2 squared, 2 to the 3rd. And 2 to the 4th. So it always starts at 2 to the 0 and then goes up. Now 2 to the 0 is equal to 1. 2 to the 1st is 2. 2 squared is 4. 2 to the 3rd is 8. And 2 to the 4th is 16. Now if I take whatever digit is right here and I multiply it by this, so I'm going to have 1 times 16 plus, now I take whatever digits here and I multiply by this digit. So I got 0 times 8 plus, and then I'm going to take this digit and multiply it times this. So I've got 1 times 4 plus, and then I'll take this and multiply it by this. So I got 1 times 2. And then I'll take uh, whatever digit I have here and multiply by this number. So I got 1 times 1. Now this, uh, in case you're wondering, is an example of how to go from binary to decimal, base 10. So if you got any problems um, on the quiz or tests ask you to do that, this is, this is how you do it. Um, so 1 times 16 is 16, 0 times 8 is 0, 1 times 4 is 4, 1 times 2 is 2, 1 times 1 is 1. So I got 20, 22, 23. So 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, and I'll put a 2 here for being base 2, is going to equal to 23 in base 10. You can also, it's just as easy as uh, going through and everywhere you have a 1, you just add numbers in below it. So 16 plus 4 is 20, plus another 2 is 22, 23. Now that same principle does not work when you get into other bases like uh, base 8 or base 16, um, but that, that works um, binary quite well. Is there any questions from going from binary to decimal? Let's look at going the other direction. If I had, for example, um, 300 in base 10, and I want to convert that to base 2, binary. Um, let me see. This is 2 to the 0, which is 1. 2 to the 1st, which is 2, 4, 8, 16, I hope I went up far enough, over far enough, I should say, 32, 64, 128, 256. Our next number would be 512, which is greater than 300. 
So what I do is it's, this is old style division. You're going to take your 300 and you're going to divide it by your number that's uh, the first number that's less than or equal to that. Our first number is 256. That goes in there one time, 256, or one times 256 is 256. Um, hmm. Is it 44? Okay. Now this one that you see up here, that's going to go in the spot above the 256. So we're working now with 44. So that's a new number we're working with. Now, does 128 go into it? No. So that's going to be a 0. Does the 64 go into it? No. So that's a 0. 32, does that go into it? Yeah. So 44 divided by 32 is 1. Uh, 1 times 32 is 32. So that's 2, 12. So this 1 we found right here goes above the 32. And the new number we're working with is 12. Does 16 go into it? No. So does 8 go into it? Yeah. So 12 divided by 8 is 1. Um, 1 times 8 is 8. Uh, subtract those, it gives me 4. So this 1 here goes above your 8. New number I'm working with is 4. Does 4 go into 4? Yeah. So it goes into it one time, and I've run out of room here, but that would be 1 times 4 is 4, and I come up with a remainder of 0. And I put a 1 above the 4, because that's what we're dividing by. Now, once you get to a remainder of 0, you don't have to ask that question anymore. Everything else is just automatically zeros. So 300 base 10 would equal to 1, 0, 0. One zero one one zero zero base two. When you're writing a computer program um, and the user inputs three hundred, this translation is being done for you, so it can it can talk with, uh, to the computer. It can store it and, and all that. Any questions going from base ten to base two? Um, that just gives you gives you some examples there, but we've already went through went through that. Binary, binary to decimal conversion table that gives you um, a table you can use for for conversions. Um, obviously, it doesn't work very well if you go beyond 31. That's why you have to use that technique I just showed you. Now, that here they talk about the shortcuts. Converting from binary to decimal says add up the power of the 2 where a 1 appears in a binary number. Remember how I talked about that? We just go through and add numbers underneath them with the 1s. Now, converting the other way from decimal to binary... Uh, it says repeatedly divide by two and record the remainder. Um, I like my method better. Um, but. Computers use fixed length binary numbers for integers. Uh, four bits could represent 0 to 15. 0 to 15. Notice when you look at this table. 0 to 15 is 4 bits, isn't it? Bits being like a series of zeros and ones. Now, uh, arithmetic overflow, when a computer tries to make a number that's too large, example 14 plus 2 with 4 bits, that's where you uh, run across issues. Binary addition. Um, 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 1 is 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is um, 1, 0.
It's kind of weird. Again, some of this stuff is not as clear cut as a CSS. That's why I'm focusing on this. Now, when we're talking binary, the only digits you can use are 0 and 1. 1 plus 0 is 1. What's 1 plus 1? We're going to put a 0 because it's a 2 exactly, but we can't use a 2. So we put a 0 and then we carry 1. Because this 1 represents a power of 2 that we've carried over. So then 1 plus 1 is 2. So we're going to put what? 0 and carry the 1. 1 plus 1 is 2. So we'll put a 0 and carry the 1. That's what they're referring to on the um, PowerPoint over here. When they say 1 plus 1 is equal, it looks like 10. Uh, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1, and so the next digit over is 1. That makes sense? Much as binary can. And I gave you an example. Um, now, assigned integers include negative numbers. The sign magnitude notation uses one bit for the sign and the rest for the value. Um... Like if you just look at 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. This first spot, that's 2 to the 0. That's 1, right? This next one's 2 to the 1st, which is uh, 2. And this is 2 squared, which is 4. So we got 4 plus 1, which is 5. So the 5 is represented by those last three digits there. That's 5 no matter what. Now a positive we indicate by putting a zero here. A negative, we indicate by putting a one as our first digit. So that's just by convention. There's no mathematical behind that. They just said, okay, for positives, the first digit will be a zero. For negatives, the uh, first digit will be a one. Now you have to handle that accordingly. Like if you're designing something with eight, a lot of registers and computers are eight bits. Then if you're going to use just those eight bits, you have to say your first one is always going to represent your sign if you're using that idea, which means you only got seven, seven places to work with. So if you got larger numbers, you have to do it differently. Um, zero. Well, zero is represented by zero, zero, zero. And here um, we got a positive zero. But it also says it can be represented with a 1. Why? Yeah. And 0 doesn't have a sign, does it? It can be positive or negative. It's still the same same principle. Now, it talks about the 2's complement. It says to make the negative number flip every bit and add 1. Hmm. kind of a simplistic way of thinking of it. Um, you remember two's complement? Yeah. Let me take a look at a two's complement. I'll put you on a spot. I'll see how I remember, how well you remember it. Okay, so I'm trying to find the two's complement. What do I do with the zero? Right. So any zeros coming from the right side, you leave alone. Don't touch. How about this one here? Yeah, so that would be a two minus one is one. So basically, it stays one. Now, what do you do with the rest of these then? Yeah. So one minus zero is one. One minus one is zero. This is a two's complement. And let me write that out. Some of your 
at least here looking. <laughs> ah. So a two's complement, starting from the right side. Leave zeros alone. So you don't change this at all. It just zero remains a zero. Until you hit your first one. And basically, it remains as is. Mathematically, if you're looking at uh, complements with 9's complement, 10's complement, and so forth, you're actually subtracting from the base, 2 minus 1. But it remains a 1. And then the rest of the digits um, flip. So zeros become 1's. So zeros become 1's. And 1's become zeros. That's the simplistic way of thinking of it. I can't see if anybody's still writing it down. So if I yank something away and you start writing it down, holler. Everybody got that written down that's writing it down? Okay. So looking at this number here, one thing I meant to do this uh, this last weekend is to find me a little where your your pointers yellow you got a little yellow circle on it. There's there's my mouse. Okay, so one one zero uh, one. Zero. So our two's complement zero is coming from the right side, you leave alone until you hit your first non zero, your first one. That remain one remains as is. And then all the rest of these flip digits. So this zero becomes a one, this one becomes a zero, this one becomes a zero. And that would be our two's complement. Once you get used to it, it's a simple, simple idea. Applying it to other bases uh, is a little bit more than, more than those rules I gave you. Okay. Now, the, where we'd use this at, we're not going to really go into that kind of depth in here. Where you'd use that at is if you're um, trying to subtract numbers, you don't subtract numbers. What you do is you rewrite it using the two's complement, you add them, and then you can use two's complement to switch it back um, if necessary. Um, so it's a way we can uh, program the computer such we don't have to do subtraction. You might say, well, what's so wrong with subtraction? Um, from a um, uh, complexity standpoint, it's a, it costs a lot more in designing circuits. It, uh, costs a lot more in times of processor speed and so forth, so it's a lot easier if we do addition. Uh, floating point numbers use binary uh, scientific notation. You see you got your 1.35 times 10 to the negative 5 in base 2. Um, 3.25 um, base 10 is equal to 11.01, .01, and you write it this way. Instead of times 10 to a power, you multiply it times 2 to a power. Notice the only thing it did is what? Moved our decimal point one place, didn't it? So same principle. Uh, characters and text, map characters onto binary numbers in a standard way. Uh, our ASCII is 8-bit numbers for each character. Um, and there's ASCII charts uh, that, you can, that you can look up. I don't know if there's one in here. Let me look real quick. Uh, let's see. 
I don't see one. Now, ASCII, oftentimes, you don't have to actually put in a bunch of zeros and ones if you're programming. <laughs> Website called ASCIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIIII
example of sound uh, represented as a waveform. See that given that way. Um, interesting uh, topic on this, if you're really into the, the low level part of it. I took a wavelets class. I may have mentioned that in here, but I took a wavelets class. And the idea is when you deliver a movie to somebody, um, how can you deliver to them in the smallest form? Because if they're on their phone and they're want to watch a movie, um, how do you transmit to that through there? And uh, wavelets is how you you take a uh, waveform and you um, you transform it, send it to wherever it's going, and then you reintegrate it into a form you can use. Unfortunately, it was an all theory class at Wichita State. I really wanted to know how to program. I wanted to uh, be able to write a program that, that could create a new MP4. Like I developed a new algorithm for, um, not smart enough, but um, I developed a new algorithm that would um, create the smallest movie possible that you could send to through there. By the way, the, pers the person or the company that came up with the, M the MP4 format, how much do you think they're making now? What? Nothing. If it's an individual, they're probably being paid royalties from uh, every everything that uses MP4. Um, so they're probably not working the rest of their life. If it's a company, then I don't know about that. And maybe it's an open source type thing. Somebody created it and said the uh, format's out there, use it. Um, there's lots of other formats, a lot of other video formats available, and some of them are proprietary. You can't use them unless you uh, pay them or you get permission. So. There was some trouble. There was some trouble with that with a um, a place here in Kansas, is Educam. They were using some kind of video uh, format that they hadn't got approval for, they hadn't paid the company, and they they got in a lot of trouble over that. They got sued and everything. You know, because if I if I put a lot of effort in de designing a new, the new MP5 uh, video format, I don't want people to steal it, do I? Okay, digitize to convert to a digital form. Uh, sampling record sound wave values at fixed discrete values. We've got our sampling rate, bit depth. Um. Look at these pictures here. You got your original signal. And then uh, recreating the uh, signal from the sampled values. What's happened with that? It's not smooth, is it? Um, there's a cost to be paid for. And that talks about any transformation you do. You can transform an audio or video, um, but it's going to lose its quality. Some of you have heard me say this, um, but no, I don't think everybody. Hopefully you didn't say it in this class. But um, I created uh, some uh, two online classes for uh, – there's a billionaire that he um, has an idea of spreading free education across the world and create a world quant university. And I uh, created two classes for him. I didn't get paid billions, in case you were wondering. Um but they didn't like the quality of what I had created. And so uh, I was creating it with uh, Camtasia. And so I finally took up all the, all the um, transformation, the, you know, where it puts it into a modified form. And I took it just to the raw video. Have you ever worked with raw video? Huge. It was just like a, just a, a couple minutes was a, you know, a terabyte of data type of, you know, it's just like a huge amount. Um, I've very realized my, uh, realized quickly a 10 minute video probably would fill up uh, my hard drive, um, that I had, um, not a terabyte, but it was huge. Um, it's probably like 20 gig or something like that. Um, obviously a 20 gig file, you couldn't send through the air to your phone, right? So you apply, um, these transformations to put in a reduced format. Now, if that was a if that was an audio signal, do you think you would even notice a difference? No. 
No. No. Am I saying all of those are the exact same? Same volume? No. They all sound the same? Yeah. You know, they're kind of a little bit of fluctuation. And the same way with signal. When you um, retransform it, you, you change it in the first place, um, it's not the same quality, but you're probably not going to hear the difference. Uh, let's see, image sampling, record um, color or intensity at fixed discrete intervals, pixels, uh, individual recorded samples, RGB encoding, uh, raster graphics. I can go over all that. Um, what's a popular video or a picture format for the web? JPEG, PNG. I think I mentioned before bitmap. Bitmap has better quality, but it's also a huge file. So again, the idea is how can you deliver a web page to somebody and um, reduce the quality, but so they don't even notice. So that's why you use JPEG and so forth. It doesn't have as good a quality as some of the some of the ones you have. Some of you have taken a Photoshop class. Uh, some of those uh, original Photoshop files and get huge, can't they? Depends on what kind of format you save them in also. Um, it, was, it was you in yesterday's class. Remember how that ship, you blew it up and you said it looked horrible, pixel-wise? Uh, that's because our original image was already transformed in the first place. So when you make it big, then it looks horrible. Um, but if you had a different video, a different um, picture format, then if you make it bigger, it wouldn't have that loss. There's vector-based graphics. The idea behind that is that you can resize something. It looks just as good uh, half an inch by half an inch as it does two feet by two feet. Um, Adobe Flash was based upon vector graphics originally. And that was their idea is you have this Adobe and you make it whatever size you want, the Flash uh, application, and it'd look great. Um, this talks about uh, the binary number system for um, grayscale, going from 0 to 7. Again, we got eight, 8 bits there, don't we? And data compression, storing data in a reduced size form to say space slash time. Um, lossless, data can be perfectly restored. Lossy, if I'm saying that right, data cannot be perfectly restored. This is really nice, but to restore it perfectly um, might be too costly. This might be a better, better solution. Um... I think how this relates to what we looked at in the other class. You remember BCD, what the numbers were at all? I think this might be BCD, but uh, it doesn't really say. This BCD was our four. Is it BCD? No? Okay. Um, you can have whatever encoding you want. Um, BCD is just a way to define, uh, like if I had uh, the, the letters uh, PAL, P-A-L. I could look up P, which might be 1010. I look up A, which is 000. And I could look up L, which is 1011. And concatenate those together and give it to me. Is that um, BCD? Kind of? Okay. <laughs> So the, the idea is you don't have to sit there and do this hideous calculation uh, on a within your um, your whatever you whatever you're designing. Like if you're at low level designing a computer, you don't have to sit there and try to do that uh, calculation for converting things to binary. You would represent just as I indicated. You look at each letter separately. You look up P. 
and P would be 1010. You look up A, A is four zeros. You look up L, which is 1011. And that's how it would be represented in the in a computer system. Again, your goal is just to break it down to a bunch of ones and zeros. Uh, so you can then um, program your gates, you know, on and off type of deal. Um, current on and off, magnetic field, left, right. I thought what was really interesting in the other class, the Introduction to Digital Design, is that for something to uh, be on, the voltage has to be within a certain range of values, which means if your voltage is a little bit off, it may not come through quite correct. And they got uh, cor correcting factors you can do on that. Wasn't very comforting. I guess I always thought that um, ones and zeros would be going across reliably. But <laughs> sir, are, are, do you have actually ones and zeros going across a circuit? No, you have what going across? Volts. Yeah, so you have your volts going across your circuit. And if the volts within a certain range, that specifies it's one or it's on. So this talks about transistors, solid state switches, change on and off when given a power uh, control line. Extremely small, billions per chip. Uh, enable computers that work with work with uh, gigabytes of data. And it shows you a picture representation of an integrated circuit and uh, how it uh, works with the circuit board. Boolean logic is a rule for manipulating uh, true or false expressions for binary machine language. Um, we're actually looking at that now in the introduction to digital design. Boolean expressions can be converted to circuits. So if you're sitting there designing a circuit, you're going to Wichita State, and you're going to these, these, go into their computer engineering or even computer science, and which is has a lot of the low-level stuff in it. Um, then uh, you'll be working Boolean expressions. You you manipulate those, and then you can translate those directly to circuits. Hardware design, logic design pertains to design and construction of the new circuits. Binary one-zero maps to true/false a Boolean logic. Um, now, how that relates to programming, and they actually call it Boolean expressions, is uh, Boolean expressions, X is less than or equal to 35. And I say that's a Boolean expression because it's either true or false. Um, how about if X was 10? Would that be true or false? True? Because 10 is less than or equal to 35, right? Now, A is equal to 12. Um, I don't know what the answer is to that one. It depends. In programming, most programming languages We haven't talked about the programming side yet, but most programming languages will say if A is equal equal one, they'll have something like this, or they'll say if A is dot equal one, or there's all kinds of variations of that. And what this checks is checks to see if A is equal to one. So if I set A equals five up here at the top, and it comes down to here, is A is is A equal to one? No. So this would be false. Z or zero in terms of binary. Now, um, if you're taking a programming class, most programming languages interpret this as the assignment. So what it's doing is it's assigning one to A. So it's putting one to the variable A. Um, do you think that's true or false? Hmm. 
true. It's always true. I don't know how many times that's bit me over the, the 20 some 20 some years I've been programming. Uh, the programming languages allow you to put an equals there. Uh, it always works no matter what. <laughs> and you, you actually are trying to program an if else. So if this is true, you do this, uh, else you do this. And no matter what, my code would be sitting here doing this, this code right here. And the reason why this is always true, because I forgot to put an extra equals. Um, I, the programming languages that prevent you from doing that are the ones I really like. That say, hey, you got you can't have an equals here. Um, because I can't really think of when you'd ever really want one. So like I can say, I have no clue what the A equals 12 represents here. It depends upon your programming language. Now, just from a human standpoint, you know, we think of it as that actually equals, not an assignment operator. Okay, Boolean operators, um, you can have an and, an or, or not. Um, we haven't talked about this yet in the other class, but a, a um, not one. Or we actually digit one. What do you think that'd be? Uh, false, zero. So it's opposite. So not uh, flips it to the opposite. Um, and then and and or, we're not going to uh, go to it yet. Uh, truth tables lay out true false values for Boolean expressions for each possible true or false uh, input. So if I have my possibilities, like I got X and Y. We can have 1, 1, 0, 0. And I could, this could be a 1, this could be a 0. This could be a 1, this could be a 0. Those are all of our possibilities. Now, um, a truth table is you start building this. We got X or Y. What would this be? Uh, what would this be for the first one? Zero. Uh, zero one. One. And then, one. And zero. Yeah. And these are all the things you can program in in like a circuit. How about this? Remember this one? Uh, remember the and you think of it as multiplication? The addition, this was addition, but it was just a little bit weird. You know, zero plus zero is zero, zero plus one is one, one plus uh, zero is one. But then you got one plus one, which should give you two, but it gives you one. Yeah. So what's this first one here? One. Zero, 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 zero. So this is a truth table. Um, and you can have all kinds of combinations of this. Uh, you could have like this, which is a, a not X with a prime. And so then X flips. Uh, so X is one, one, zero, zero. So this would be zero, zero, one, one. And you could find this right here. Where you find each one of these and you perform the operation uh, that's there and come up with it. Now, if I just put you to sleep on that right there and you're planning on going into computer engineering, you're probably going to run major. <laughs> that's what uh, tons of that uh, exciting stuff like that is. Now, if you find that found that enthralling, then um, it could be computer engineering, where's where you want to go. Now they give you here like false, false, true, true, but uh, again, true is it one, false is zero. Here's a plus. Um, again, they, truth tables don't usually have actually true and false, usually ones and zeros. And uh, the not flips it. Uh, 
know, this might actually not be too bad to show in the next class. So I thought this book doesn't do a very good job of talking about uh, just dives right in with these these um, uh, different symbols and doesn't say what they represent. Now, a gate is an electronic device that operates uh, on inputs to produce uh, outputs. So each gate corresponds to a Boolean operator. You see the um, that's the AND gate where you got the circle and so forth. And um, down below, you see um, we got A and uh, B. And the only time it's ever equal to a 1 is when it's 1 and 1. So if you had your design of the AND gate in your circuit, um, what does A and B represent coming into it? Voltage, right? So that represents voltage coming in, which means you have a certain amount of voltage coming in on both of them. And then it, it handled accordingly. You see the OR gate, and they have little times in there and a little plus. Uh, the times is exactly like you think of it, 0 times 0, 0 times 1, and so forth. The plus is uh, exactly like you think of it, except for 1 plus 1 is 1. So other than that, it's, it's, it's what you'd think. And then the little triangle with a, a circle in front of it, that's your not gate. Now, they put a bar over it for a, the A bar. Some books will put a complement uh, or A prime where they put A and then the little prime. Again, that represents not A. Oops. Okay. Gates are built from transistors. Uh, not gate, uh, one transistor. And gate is three transistors. Uh, or gate is three transistors. Um, the not and, not or is two transistors. Uh, transistors can be in series or parallel. Um, that shows up the power supply. And then you get a resistor and then um, you get your different inputs and outputs and, and so forth there. So you think there's ones that you can design that um, provide a cheaper circuit? Some of those require three transistors, right? So definitely if you can rewrite your, your Boolean um, so that it's less complex, you can reduce the number of um, transistors you have to have in your circuit. In your circuit design, I should say. Uh, this goes, shows the construction of it. It's a little bit different uh, symbols that are used in the other book. Here's some more. Okay, building a computer circuit. Um, circuit has a input wires, contains uh, gates connected by wires, and has output wires. Um, uh, outputs depend only on current inputs, no state. Where was electricity discovered? 1800 sometime, wasn't it? Was it 17? No, it wasn't 1700s. That would have been uh, Civil War, not Civil War. The... We didn't have the electricity during the Civil War, right? 1879. So we've had it maybe 140 years, electricity. Isn't it amazing that somebody came up with the idea from the point where, you know, electric, electricity coming from the sky in terms of lightning, that we're to the point where we're sending electrical uh, through a circuit to do everything we're doing. Makes you wonder where we'll be another 140 years from now. The what? They never know. They, they, um, some of the new technology they're coming out with, uh, one one uh, professor made the claim that uh, people are going to be living to 1,000 years old for too long. Um, now I'm going to be dead by then. I'm happy about that. I can't imagine working for 990 years before I can retire. Um, <laughs> I like my job, but I don't like it that well. You know, 
Somebody said, well, you can invest wisely and then go to the beach. And it's just like, I don't know. The first hundred years going to the beach would be fun. But after that, I think it'd be a nightmare. I dread going to the beach. It's just like, <laughs> you'd be so bored. <laughs> You can see it with some of the technology, like uh, nanobots. You know, they got the nanobots on a molecular level now, and they're working on it traveling through your body. And if it can identify like a cancer cell from a regular cell, it could just kill the cancer cell. Same with an AIDS cell. So when you can kill every every uh, foreign element in your body with these nanobots, and you could deliver medicine to like places that need to be regenerated, you can see living to a thousand years old. <laughs> How many people would it be on Earth then? <laughs> Too, many. Too many, yeah. Uh, to convert a circuit to a Boolean expression, start with the output and work backwards. Uh, find the next gate back, convert to a Boolean operator, repeat um, for each input, filling in left and or right side. To convert a Boolean expression to a circuit, a uh, similar approach. Uh, to build a circuit from desired outcomes, use a standard circuit construction algorithm, uh, e.g. sum of products algorithm. Convert a circle, a circuit, to a Boolean expression. That implies they can uh, reverse uh, engineer uh, an existing circuit, couldn't they? An example from the test. Uh, I don't want to go into that. Quickly running out of time. Okay. Uh, this shows a circuit diagram. Um, and there's a, uh, I haven't got it uh, fully installed yet, um, but there's a uh, software that you can use to create this. I haven't got it fully installed yet or even uh, tested yet, but um, multi-sim. I don't. Have, I didn't put it on my computer. I guess put it on all the other computers here at Wellington, but my I couldn't get mine to work. Um, but you you build this. That's your design. Then you construct two, the truth table describing the behavior of the desired circuit. Uh, while there's still output column in the truth table, do steps three through six. Select an output column, sub expression. Uh, construction using AND and NOT gates, uh, using OR gates and circuit diagram production, then you're done. Uh, compare for equality uh, CE circuit. Input is two unsigned binary numbers. Output is one if inputs are identical and zero otherwise. Um, so forth. I remember this from my um, my courses on working with uh, or talking about computer circuits. Uh, it talks about a full adder uh, circuit, and um, there's a cost associated with that that particular circuit, uh, but it's less than uh, other designs, and that's why we don't do subtraction ever with with uh, the digital we rewrite multi addition. And um, Again, I'm not going to go over that. This talks about your different cases. And you have to really follow these. These are kind of hard to, to follow sometimes. Um, like case one there. Um, it says A bar. That's not A. Now that's kind of small. But you see how A is coming in here? There's a line flowing. And then hits this triangle with a little circle. That's what flips it. And um, that's the not A coming in. And it first comes through here. And this is an AND, isn't it? So that's an AND. So that's a not A AND. And then you see B coming in. And this uh, flips it. And then it comes up here. And that's not A and not B. And now that comes in, and then C is coming from down here. 
So C is coming down from there. I'll come like that. Um, now again, it all goes back to these these definitions here, with our and, or, and our not. Which then goes back to, you know, this design here. Okay. Does that um these make sense, these these circuits? How you interpret it? Um So how could you get this sum here? Remember how they said you start with your end result and go backwards? So this right here is a an OR, isn't it? So you have an OR in there. Then the first part of the OR, you come back here, and this is another OR. Then come back there, there's an and, here's an and. Come back here, an and. So that's where you can build build it going backwards. By the way, what's this doing right here? It's adding, isn't it? So that's how you do uh, the addition. Now here, it's also doing an addition. Um, remember the carry bit from Introduction to Digital Design? The carry, we would have that carry over. Sometimes you just drop it. Sometimes you do something with it. This is, that's what this is kind of referring to. Uh, let's see. Okay, control circuits, uh, make decisions, determine order of operations, select data values. Uh, multiplexer selects one from on many inputs. You got two to the end input lines, in selector lines, and one output line. Um, each input line corresponds to a unique pattern on selector lines, and then that input value is passed to output. Um, we still haven't got the machines yet. Uh, the little Elvis machines for that uh, digital design class. But the idea is, and I can show you what these look like, if we have it. And it just shows you an example of a two-input multiplexer circuit. Decoder sends signal out to only one output chosen by its input. As an example, we got our decoder circuit uses. Select a single arithmetic instruction, given a code for that instruction. Code activates one output line that 
line activates corresponding arithmetic uh, circuit. Multiplexer, uh, choose from to choose one data value from on a set uh, based on selector pattern. Many data values flow into a multiplexer, only the selected one comes out. We've got a control circuit here for decoding. The division and subtraction and multiplication you see here is not what you might actually think. Um, it's a different type of operation done on a computer. Okay, just a brief summary. Uh, customers use, or customers, computers use binary representation because they maximize reliability for electronic systems. Um, many kinds of data may be represented at least in an approximate digital form using binary values. Data can be compressed. You got your lossy, some information is lost. Lossless, no information is lost. Boolean logic describes how to build and manipulate expressions that are true or false. We can build logic gates that act like Boolean operators using transistors. Uh, circuits may be built from logic gates. Circuits correspond to Boolean expressions. Some of the products is a circuit design algorithm takes the specification ends of the circuit. And we can build circuits for basic uh, algorithmic tasks. Um, and you see the ones given there. And that's really all of that, that chapter there. Let's see what I can cover in six minutes time on this other one. Tutorial three, designing a page layout. Um, this is kind of interesting. Creating a reset style sheet is if um, you want to create a code that kind of nullifies anything that comes in style wise. Then you can, um, and this seems kind of real obvious, font size set to 100%, uh, margin zero, padding zero, vertical line, baseline, uh, list style none, list style image none, text declaration none, line height one. So you have that to begin with, and then you're making sure that whatever's coming in is kind of reset. Um, Page layout designs, you get your fixed layout, fluid layout, and elastic layout. Um, fixed is uh, set in stone, no matter what, it looks like this. Your fluid, uh, they're set as a percent. And you'll see this in different uh, elements, HTML tags too, like in a table. You can say this first column is 25%, the second column is 75%. And no matter what size your screen is, it'll uh, resize it. We got our elastic layout. Images and text are always sized in proportion to each other in uh, EM units. Um, this causes major headaches if you go on and uh, develop any apps for like cell phones. Um, oftentimes these these are put in reference to each other in terms of how many how many distances between them. This talks about the responsive design, layout and design of page changes in response to devices rendering it. Um, used to be you didn't worry about this. Uh, everybody had the same computer. It was an 800 by 600 uh, monitor, which sounds ridiculous when you think about sizes, uh, your resolution, all that now. Um, that's what you program for. But now people run their, um, their programs on uh, their cell phones. Um, some of you go to your, um, uh, when you go to Cali, you go to Cali on your cell phone, right? Has to look good. Now you can have mobile, mobile design where you, um, design it for your cell phone, but you can also have this kind. You got your width and height, you put values there. Sometimes this works. Sometimes this doesn't. It all depends upon which tag you're using. Uh, some of them doesn't make make sense on. How about images? Think it'd work well on images? Mm 
The what? Yeah. How about um, uh, horizontal horizontal rules, HRs? Probably wouldn't work on HRs, would it? Because horizontal rules do not have, a, you know, a height, do they? All they are is just a line going across. Um, they don't have a width. The idea of a horizontal rule is goes clear across your page. So, like I say, some of these will work on some, but not others. Uh, two minutes. Uh, This talks about uh, floating um, element. I think the book does a pretty good job talking about all that, though. So. We're about one minute from being done, so... That's probably close enough. Um, again, if you haven't started doing the stuff out in MindTap, uh, do it in MindTap. I would recommend uh, creating your um, tutorials actually in MindTap instead of uh, doing a notepad separately. Uh, because if you do it in MindTap, uh, what does it do as you go along? Checks it. Yeah, so it guides you. It says, uh, hey, you got this wrong. And um, so then you can figure out what you, what you did wrong in that one little piece. Versus trying to do the entire thing uh, in Notepad, um, that's kind of the you know there's an incremental approach, uh, which is the way MindTap is designed. Then there's like the Big Bang approach where you try to do it all at once, and that that's that, that can be overwhelming. Um, so again, if you're behind on some of that, um, get caught up. If you're not figuring out how to do something, edit, copy what you have HTML wise, put it in Notepad, and email me the file. Uh, you might have to zip it. Yeah, zip it up and send it to me. And um, if you never if you never zipped anything up, you right click on the HTML and send a compressed folder. I think if you send me the actual HTML, it does weird things, like puts puts it all on one line. Uh, if I remember right, we're out of time. Is there any questions? Or anything? No.